Here is an Altux HT153 surround sound home theater receiver with DVD player. This is a recent e-waste find. It's just a cheap thing, but these cheap things often contain interesting electronic components that can be salvaged for DIY projects. Also, I am curious, how did they manage to fit a DVD player, a 5.1 channel surround sound amplifier, a power supply and everything else into this relatively small case? So it is time for a teardown. But before, let's take a look around. The front is this mirrored plastic effect, which I would say dates this thing into the mid-2000s. There is a real hard power switch right on the front, which is a nice feature. There is the DVD tray. Eject, play and pause, reverse, forward, and this button, which, judging by the symbol, is an input selector. There is a USB jack, but it is safe to say this is not for playback of video files. The system is simply too old for that. This is going to be for something really simple, such as putting JPEG pictures on a television screen or playback of MP3 music files. And then right here is the volume control, which is a rotary encoder. On the back, there are the speaker outputs, antenna inputs, two stereo audio inputs. There is no surround sound audio input. Audio output, this is labeled pre-out, so I would assume that this is the audio output after the volume control. There is a separate subwoofer output and a digital coaxial output. There are two video inputs to go along with the audio inputs. Video outputs, composite and S-video, and a SCART connector. And then over here is the power cord. And here is the inside of the unit after a trip to the air compressor. This was very dusty. There is a DVD drive, which still has a disc in it. This is Disney Pixar Cars. Behind, we have this relatively complex circuit board, dual layer with lots of surface mount components. Over here is the tuner, and this would be an interesting component for those who are into reverse engineering digital protocols, because if we take a look at the connectors, right here is with a shielded cable, just a standard audio output, and over here is some sort of a digital interface. So if you could reverse engineer this digital interface, you could use this as a standalone AM-FM tuner. Over here on this much simpler single layer circuit board with traditional components are the amplifier and the power supply. And this is my question answered. How did they manage to make this so small? Well, they used a switch mode power supply right there. And there is nothing wrong with that, except there is something wrong with it. Some of you may have already noticed the primary side filter capacitor has a bulging top, but it can be pushed in, so it's just the plastic cover and not the capacitor itself that's bulging. However, this indicates that this capacitor got quite hot, and that's not good. But then we have a bulging capacitor right here, which is also leaking a little bit, as you can see. And there is another bulging capacitor right there. So this thing was thrown away because the power supply failed. Let's put that theory to the test. I have the system plugged in. Let's see what happens when I turn it on. Hmm. 
nothing. Absolutely nothing. But the fuse is still fine. So, actually, see, there is a blue LED lighting up the volume control. There is no display, no other sign of life. Nope, the power supply has a problem. Well, I spoke too soon after turning it on and off multiple times. As you can see, the DVD drive is now spinning the disc and there is a display. It's kind of a dim display, but... Yep, it does seem... Well, as you can see, it's kind of uh, skipping around a bit. Actually, it does seem to be working now, so it seems like the power supply just takes a while to start up. So I can now get out the DVD. I have started the teardown. The tuner and DVD drive have been removed. And as you can see, it turns out this circuit board is quite a bit larger than it seemed because this section was covered up by the DVD drive. Here is a closer look at the complex dual layer circuit board with surface mount components, which is not as complex as I thought, because there are no components on the bottom. This is a bit confusing because I cannot find the brain of the system. I cannot find the one central microcontroller that controls everything. And that means that everything must be somehow controlled by this chip. This is a Sun Plus SPHE 8281A DVD single chip MPEG AV processor. This processor has two memory chips right here, and right there, you can tell by the heatsink fins on either side, is the driver for the motors of the DVD drive. The processor outputs six channel digital audio. So over here is a CE2766 six-channel digital-to-analog converter, and the six analog output channels go into these six 4558 operational amplifiers. The inputs are a bit of a mystery. I'm not sure where the video signals go. The only thing that I can tell is these two chips right here. These are 74HC4052D analog multiplexers. Those are used for signal switching. The audio from these inputs must also go into this chip. And again, this chip only accepts digital audio. So down here is a CS5340 analog to digital converter two channel and this chip maybe it can then also do the Dolby digital decoding and uh, output the six channel audio from uh, those inputs but I'm not sure about that. Here are the front circuit boards. There is one separate board with the rotary encoder and blue LED and then there is this board with the vacuum fluorescent display. Under the vacuum fluorescent display is a PT6311 display driver. The USB connector goes straight to the processor we've just seen via this shielded cable. And it looked like there was an indicator LED next to this USB port, but as you can clearly see, there isn't. Here is a look into the tuner module. The front end is based on this LC72131 
AM-FM phase-locked loop frequency synthesizer, and this IC connects directly to the audio output. This tuner module is controlled by this mystery chip on the bottom. This is just labeled CS1000. I was not able to find any info on this, but it would make sense if this was a microcontroller that got its commands in through the digital interface. And finally, here is the power supply and main amplifier board. This contains the most interesting components, in my opinion, the amplifier chips. The board is split diagonally along this line, and everything over here is for the switch mode power supply. It is controlled by this chip over here. This is an FAN7554PWM controller. This is the switching transistor, and over here is a double diode. The main amplifier is based on two TDA8947J amplifier chips. Each one of these chips has four amplifier channels in it. So there is a total of eight channels. The channels can be configured in two different ways. You can run them in single-ended mode, where one speaker is connected to one amplifier output. In that case, you get 14 watts of output power. Or you can configure two channels into a bridge. In that case, one speaker is connected between the two outputs of two amplifier channels. In that case, you get 29 watts of output power. Of course, the subwoofer is run in bridge mode because it requires the most output power. The other five channels are run in single-ended mode. You can tell by the presence of five output capacitors and because five of the output channels have their negative terminal connected to ground. Meanwhile, the subwoofer output, you can tell there are two separate connections going off to one of the chips. Now, of course, that means there are eight channels. Two of them are for the subwoofer. That means there are six left over, but we have only five more channels. So that means one of these uh, channels in these amplifiers is not used, which is interesting. I have seen a different system where they had a similar setup, and in that system they decided to also run the center speaker in bridge mode, just so that they wouldn't waste that uh, one channel. But they didn't do it in this system. Unfortunately, these two chips are not very well suited to DIY projects because these contain an even more complicated standby circuit than usual. I have gotten quite used to these chips having one pin for standby and you have to feed in a specific voltage to get the chip to turn on. Well, these chips have two standby pins and you have to feed in a combination of voltages to control which one of all those four channels turns on. It's individually controllable. Unnecessary. I think these standby circuits are a nuisance. They make DIY projects more complicated than they should be. So that is a little unfortunate. And here are all the components that I have salvaged. I'm keeping the whole entire power supply and main amplifier board. There is no point unsoldering the amplifier ICs. I don't think I'm going to need them anytime soon. 
The switch mode power supply should be interesting once the capacitors have been replaced, because this will certainly output some unusual voltages and not just the standard 5 and 12 volts. There are some motors, a belt, a blue LED, a micro switch. The rotary encoder, this had contact problems, but these can be opened up and the contacts can be cleaned. There are the antenna connectors and some more connectors. Yeah, this is the problem with unsoldering components from double layer circuit boards. I literally spend like 10 minutes trying to get this out. I remove the old solder, I added new solder, remove that and still it ended up looking like this. But these S-Video jacks are quite unusual, so that's an interesting component to keep. There is the power switch with its cable still attached, and some more cables. There is some random hardware, and the back panel, which once again is only interesting for this section. It's so much easier installing RCA jacks into a panel when you can use a section of an existing panel because this has all the holes cut in just the right places. I'm also keeping the top cover and the power cord. Thank you for watching.